sickle cell champion. Um, Joe Mudukiza. I'm 28 years old. I'm turning 29 in August. So I'm a sickle cell champion. Um, I come from a family of uh, five siblings. I'm the second born. And I'm the only one who has sickle cell. The sickle cell is hereditary. We have a carrier in the family, um, but I'm the only one who has the condition. So I was born with sickle cell because it's hereditary. Um, but I wasn't told that I had the condition until when I was joining Form 1 because I wanted to go to a boarding school. Um, when you're going to boarding school, it means that your mom will not be there to take care of you or anybody else. You, are, you have to depend on yourself. So that is when the school nurse and my mom told me. But um, when I was still young, I was still in primary school, I used to have medication uh, all the time, and I had a timetable for the, uh, for the medicine. And um, I, keep, I kept on asking my mom why I'm on medication, and she, she always told me that I was a special child. So, of course, being a child and you're told you are special from anyone else, uh, you feel better. So I never uh, asked so many questions um, about why I have medication and other people do not. Uh, so my teachers kept on um, giving me time to take the medication and reminding me uh, because they also had um, a, a schedule of, uh, of the, the, uh, uh, the medication. Uh, so when I was in high school, that's when I was told I had sickle cell. Of course, I didn't know what it was. So I, I never bothered until when I got to Form 2, and it was um, a bit hectic to go through. Um, through the school, I actually transferred schools within Form 1 and Form, form 2. So um, when I went to the other school near home now, that is when I started doing research and asking my mom. So um, that is um, when I knew that whatever I had was not something special, but it was something um, quite dangerous. Yeah. No, I think I went through boarding school, but I transferred. I transferred from um, one boarding school that was far from home, and then I went to another boarding school that was near home, because um, the first school I went to in Form One, I think uh, the nurses were not understanding me, so the the deputy actually. I uh, did research and got a school that is near my home, Alafakani and Ikea, transfer later. Um, that time he referred me, not my parents. I think he talked to, to his colleagues over the other school and then Akani and Ikea to Barua. And then the following year, I went to another school near home. So I went to Lomakanda Boys High School. It's, it's um, in Kakamega County. That's actually near home. We were living in Lumakanda by then. I always had a conversation with, uh, with both my parents. My parents were quite learned, so they understood um, the repercussions and everything that I was going through. And so my dad is the one who used to take me to hospital most of the time. Um, my mom just um, she was at home most of the time, uh, getting medication and preparing. Sometimes I, would, I was an, an off-school person. I was in and out of school. But I was quite intelligent. I, uh, I would go home and then come do an exam. I was never at bottom 10, even though I was at home most of the time. I was always at, at the top five. So um, the only thing that actually was hindering me 
and to focus on studies was the condition itself because whenever the pain starts and whenever it becomes it becomes really difficult for you to settle or um, to concentrate on something especially school you can't sit in class and you are in pain so um, uh, i went to to school in in the at le around 2000 Build your website today with GoDaddy web hosting plan. Faster load times are great for busy businesses that need more. And 2008, 2009, people didn't understand what SQL Cell was, especially students at school. So most of the time, everybody was avoiding me uh, because they did not understand what it was and what I was going through. So whenever I was in pain or I had a pain crisis, everybody would, um, would move away. So there will be rumors around the school, um, I'm a devil worshiper or something, I'm in a cult. Uh, sometimes there will be a lot of those, but I got to a point where I found, I just got used to it. Whenever anybody, at first I used to cry and go to the nurse, but then I got used to it. People were talking when I pass, and I, I never used to care, because as much as I, I understood myself, I never wanted to explain myself to to anybody, because as as much as you try to explain whatever you are going through. Uh, your peers uh, misinterpret it and give out different uh, different news. So I just kept it to myself. Then and I wanted to be a journalist when I was when I was in school all the time. But my dad wanted me to be to be a teacher. So um, I think I grew into being a teacher. Um, because that's what my dad wanted. I, also, my sister, my elder sister, is a high school teacher as of now. When I finished high school, I, I think I taught for some time. Um, but I stopped. I was a teacher of English and literature, but um, after some time, I, I decided to, um, to quit because of my condition. I can't be standing in class for an hour and then I, I get a crisis. Of course, I, I started teaching when, when students would understand that someone is, is sick, but then I didn't want to, to be the one missing lessons and having, being at loggerheads with the administration, so I had to, um, to give up um, the career then. Yeah, and then I started. I started teaching drama because drama was um, was just within the first uh, four months of the year. So I, w I would I would teach drama, and then um, the, uh, the rest of the year uh, I do things that are not stressful to my body. Yeah. Um, when I was growing up. Um, I was really isolated from the society, from a lot of things um, that I couldn't do, that people thought I wouldn't be able to, able to do. So uh, when I grew up, uh, um, taking care of someone else be became quite a responsibility for me. So when, when I have responsibilities, I feel that I have something to live for. Um, so when they're, they're here, at, um, they're at home, and I leave in the morning, I, I come in the evening, I know that I'm, I'm going to work and I'm going to support people. Uh, there are people at home that um, are depending on me. So it, it makes me to, uh, my mot it gives me a motive to keep on moving on. Yeah, so every time you want to give up, those are the people who give you strength. You remember about them, they are still in high school, um, they are still in primary school, and then you, you keep on moving.
I used to go to go to work most of the time, um, but eventually I had to stop um, because you get hired today. Some some employers used used to understand me. They understand me, but I got to a point myself where I thought they understand me. Yes, but I'm. Oh, 30 days, I'm at work, maybe seven days. So it felt like I was training them and not me. So I decided to stay at home, but most of them did not want to lay me off. I don't remember uh, working somewhere and they told me because of your condition and we have to fire you. So it's me that I I used to give up uh, on myself. So sometimes I write a um, resignation letter, sometimes I just stay at home. And so sometimes I write a um, resignation letter, sometimes I just stay at home. And then they keep on calling me, asking me how I'm doing. Of course, they support me. Most of the employers that I've worked with, they support me when I'm in hospital once in a while. Yeah, because sickle cell is really strenuous on someone's body. Because you wake up tired, you go to bed tired, and you've done nothing. It's because the body itself is fighting for its own, on its own. So um, it makes your body tired all the time because the body is struggling to grasp some oxygen and, them, uh, and the, the blood cells, sometimes they stick in the veins, they give you uh, pain, crisis, you find that your, your chest is congested most of the time as an adult. When I, when I was a child, I don't remember being in, in too much of constraints with the condition until uh, last year. April, that's when my condition kind of worsened. Yeah, but I was at work. I was, in, I had actually gone, gone back to teaching. So I was supposed to renew my contract, but I'm, from April I did not renew because um, I started becoming unwell. Um, I think I got used to, to teaching and being around students most of the time, so most of the time, um, I'm in school with students, and sometimes teaching and sometimes doing drama. And right now, everything is bad. The condition got from um, bad to worse. Yeah. So, um, my condition started worsening in April 2023. I was in hospital most of the time. I don't remember uh, skipping one day without being going to hospital since April up to now. Uh, yesterday I was in hospital. It's only today that um, I haven't gone because you were coming, so I didn't go to hospital. But most of the time I go to hospital, I come back home with a crisis. I come back. Um, when it's not resolved, because um, since April, um, the doctors kept on um, poking my, my veins. So most most of my veins have collapsed, so they can't access any any of my peripheral veins. So meaning, if I go to hospital, I can't get fluids, I can't get medication that needs to go through the IV line. Yeah. So um, I cannot. So it it made me to become weaker by day since April uh, up to now. So it's worsened, and then I have a crisis every day, from morning to evening. Sometimes I just sit in, um, in the bed and. and even if my doctors call and ask me to go to hospital, sometimes I don't because I know that I'm going to waste my time there. And if I go to hospital, especially public hospitals, I'll be they'll admit me. And then it a month, 
200,000 and then I'll come back home after um, one day I'm sick again. Yeah. So I gave up on going to hospital and being admitted on, and not unless I'm going to hospital and coming back. So I had to, um, the last time I was, um, I was at Kenyatta, I, um, they wanted to admit me again. Um, but then they had to discharge me um, because I, I said I don't want to be admitted. So I came back home against the doctor's advice. A crisis um, is um, a pain episode that comes with sickle cell whenever um, the sickle veins stick, the sickle the red blood cells stick in the veins. So um, they come with a pain crisis. To me, a pain crisis feels like someone is ripping off my skin and it's setting broken glass into my veins. And sometimes I'm unable to talk because the moment I talk, each and every word that comes from my mouth feels like um, I'm, I'm chewing um, razor blades and swallowing them. So most of them, and by the time I finish uttering just one word, it feels like I've swallowed a hundred razor blades. So when I'm in, in pain, most of the time I, I'm inactive. I just sit and watch um, or I just sleep. Um, and people don't even talk to me that time. Or if someone talks to me, I will just use sign language because um, talking will become difficult for me during uh, that particular moment. And over time, it has increased. Sometimes I'm in pain, like 5 out of 10. And within an hour, I'm, I'm in pain, like 10 out of 10. And that one means you're unable even to think um, for yourself. So the pain is, is thinking for you. So sometimes you find when you are in crisis, you, you, you do things. Um, when the crisis ends, you try to ask yourself uh, what you are doing. And sometimes you find that you have self-harmed yourself. You've tried to commit suicide. So it's just people around you telling you that, that uh, if you you are in hospital because you tried to commit suicide and all that, yeah. And by then, I think it deactivates your your own thinking. So you think the pain is thinking for you and not yourself. Yes, sure. There are a number of surgeries, like for for the veins. Now, um, the peripheral veins can't be accessed. Um, there is a minor surgery that needs to be done whereby I need to get um, central uh, a CVC. Um, so it's inserted on the, the bigger vein through the heart. It's connected directly to the heart. So it has three valves. One is for medication, one is for blood, and then uh, one is for fluids. Um, and then there is um, another surgery that is um, supposed to be done for the vascular necrosis that is supposed to, to restore the, the flow of blood and oxygen to my hip, hip joints. And, those are the, and there are other, other minor ones, but all of those procedures are expensive. You find like um, uh, the hip replacement maybe could cost a million or something, and the, but the um, the CVC, the central nervous line, is not that expensive, and um, you need to go possibly to a private hospital that could be at least fifty thousand. Mm, but then they don't let you go with it because it, mm, when um, a line is connected directly to, to the heart, it means that it's prone to infections. So they have to admit you and train you how to use it because it's like a semi-permanent line. You'll use it until you get, uh, you get better. Yeah, because now the, line, um, the IV lines cannot be accessed. That will be the only place where um, uh, you can access and um, 
get medication, which I can't get of now. I can't get any medication or um, or um, uh, fluids that are supposed to go through the IV, like see a a drip or anything. And most of the time, um, when you have a crisis, the only solution is a drip, like the normal saline. But now I can't get all the doctors that I've gone to, or all the hospitals that I've gone to, they have um, uh, given me referrals um, saying that they are unable to access the IV lines. So they have sent me to other hospitals that was given. Uh, there's a lot of documents that were sent for me to go through so that I can make a decision um, based on myself. So they sent everything through my email for me to go through. Of course, I went through uh, uh, through everything, and then I told them I was ready. I was I was ready to uh, to do it as much as I talked to everybody in, around me or in my circle, and they were hundred percent against it. So um, I wanted to do it without my doctors knowing. But eventually, uh, I got um, a form that was supposed to be signed by two of my doctors, two of my attending doctors and um, a therapist. Um, so I called <coughs> most of the doctors that I've, um, I've, I've talked to. All of them declined on the phone. I called them through phone they declined because somehow they cannot be part of that journey. So like five give me an appointment to talk about that issue face to face. Of course they they were not saying yes. They wanted to hear it from 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 my own mouth. So I talked to them and they made it clear that they are in that profession to preserve life and not to end it. So they declined to sign all, all those forms.